Oh, it's a well, great story. It's an absolutely great story. I would, did, was it during college? I think we were still in college, yeah. It's December, 1971. 25 years since It's a Wonderful Life was released and quickly disappeared from the collective memory, mostly taking its director Frank Capra's career with it. I'm taking you to New York City, to a townhouse on the Upper East Side. Three childhood friends reconnect while back home from college for Christmas break. Christopher Little, back from Yale, brings his sister Suzanne for dinner with David White at his parents' place. David's back from Harvard. We decided to watch a movie after dinner. I think we watched two movies. <laughs> and then it was literally about 3 a.m. And the start of It's a Wonderful Life came on with uh, stars twinkling and talking to each other. George is a good guy. Give him a break, God. He never thinks about himself, God. That's why he's in trouble. I love him, dear Lord. Watch over him tonight. Please, God. Something's the matter with Daddy. Please bring Daddy back. In those days, um, it wasn't a popular movie. It appeared perhaps once a year on some usually obscure ch uh, station, not not the networks. And uh, I said, wow, this looks like a loser. Let's, I guess <laughs> that's it for the evening. And Suzanne Christopher's sister, Christopher's sister said, no, absolutely. I've seen this movie. It is the greatest movie in the world, and uh, we should watch it. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. And that, in 1971, was the first time that we ever saw It's a Wonderful Life. And like three in the morning during the Christmas season in New York City. And we were spellbound and, and were absolutely uh, enraptured by it. David and his friend Christopher would soon become part of a seemingly random series of events that would turn this lost film into an American icon. Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Can't you come out tonight? Buffalo gals, can't you come out tonight and dance by the light of the moon? When I was working the clubs in the early days and just Hells Angels and drunk people and bombing like crazy, Jimmy Stewart as a waiter never didn't save my act. Like I'd be just tanking. You're hearing Dana Carvey, the comedian. Jimmy Stewart as a waiter was always the go-to, like, yeah, well, can I take your order? <laughs> well, what do you mean you don't know the specials? I told them to you 10 minutes ago. <laughs> well, what, do you want me to stand here like a trained monkey and tell them to you again? <laughs> well, what, what'd you say? Well, f*** you. <laughs> never, never failed. Never Ladies failed. and gentlemen, tonight marks an historic, not to say unique, moment in the history of both television and cinema. After a search of nearly 40 years, the fabled lost ending to Frank Capra's 1947 film, It's a Wonderful Life, has been found. Tonight, for the first time anywhere, Saturday Night Live is proud to present this priceless footage, the fully realized vision of an authentic American genius. We're still in New York City, now 1986. Eight floors up in the Rockefeller Center building, an audience watches a live taping of Dana Carvey and the rest of the cast and crew of Saturday Night Live as they perform a comedy sketch introduced by guest host William Shatner. Uncle Billy, well, what, what'd you do with it? I just called Clarence at the bank. He told me that old man Potter deposited exactly $8,000 right after I left. It was him! 
Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go get it. Wait just a second. I'll give you the money back. I don't want the money. I want a piece of you, Potter. Harry, Mary, hold him for you. Yeah, it's head of joy. At the start, you heard Christopher and David discovering a mostly unknown movie in 1971. A mere 15 years later, that same movie is now so well known that it's fertile for parody by a beloved comedy show. What happened? But perhaps we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. I should introduce myself. I'm Joseph. The Angel? You probably already know about me. Nearly a human lifetime ago, my angel colleagues and I interceded in the life of a man named George Bailey to help him understand his impact on his world. We took him to one part of the multiverse where he had never been born. But if you're hearing this podcast, you know George Bailey and his loved ones simply as beloved characters in one of the most popular movies of all time. It's a wonderful life. Starring iconic Hollywood actor Jimmy Stewart as George and Lionel Barrymore as his nemesis, Mr. Potter. You'll remember that Potter, like Ebenezer Scrooge, is consumed by greed. But in this tale, the Bob Cratchit of sorts fights back on behalf of his town of Bedford Falls, driven by his good heart. George's efforts are not quite enough, though. And when his sense of failure drives him to suicide, we angels intervene to show him what things would be like without him. I'm the one you hear every year narrating George's story as I tell it to Clarence, uh, then uh, Angel Second Class. Well, you hear Joseph Granby, the actor, playing me. Uh, But we'll get to all that. You know, I I think a lot of Americans don't really recall the first time they saw it. It's one of those movies. It's like The Wizard of Oz. It's like air. You you know, it's like, when did you start breathing? Oh, I saw it when I was a small child. It's um, I saw it with my cousin. I still remember to this day um, watching it in her living room on their TV. And um, it it just was not like anything else that I had seen. My sister and I sort of curling up on, under big blankets on the couch and watching a little tiny black and white set. Uh, you know, I was probably 10 or 11. I didn't get it. I don't think I really got the, the full existential crisis and drama and what was going on. I was a little kid. It was on Channel 11 in New York City, you know, and it was on a bunch of times. I remember not enjoying the movie very much. I was just like, why are we watching this? This is stupid. This is corny. So I've been trying to think about when the first time is that I saw It's a Wonderful Life. And my recollection is that I was in high school. It was the Christmas season. It was in that era where it was, the movie was in public domain. So it would be on 20 or 30 times like per day on every channel. And I remember uh, being home by myself, kind of sick with the cold and turning it on and And realizing that this movie that had become kind of a punchline because of its omnipresence um, was actually really good. And I remember sitting through the whole thing and getting kind of teary and emotional and thinking that I was surprised at what a good movie it was. I think I saw it, oh, probably I was 10 or 11 and like its reputation preceded it. And I was very into alternate universe stories and then i i kind of was surprised to find that it was like a a dark tale of you know this this one man's like descent into despair and then being saved through unlikely heavenly intervention i was living alone for the first time and there was a very severe thunderstorm at about 3 a.m so i turned on the tv because i was awake and i had to work early in the morning and i just decided to get up and the movie that happened to be on was it's a wonderful life And from the moment I started watching, I was absolutely transfixed, blown away. It really struck a chord with me. If you were to ask me uh, the first time I ever saw It's a Wonderful Life, I would have no idea. I mean, I was born in 1970. 
there's not a time for me where I remember it not being on. I mean, it was always on. This is Jeff Williams, who goes by the pseudonym The TV Professor. He's an investigator of a type into obscure television history. The movie was not, you know, a, a total flop in the 40s. I mean, it was not a big blockbuster. What you may be less familiar about is that Frank Capra's Liberty Films released Wonderful Life in movie theaters in December 1946, and it ran for about a year. Then it mostly disappeared. Few Americans ever knew what this movie was until the arrival of television. From 1956 to 1973, 17 years, It's a Wonderful Life would play on, on independent stations. Uh, you could find it, but it was often on the late, late movies. I remember reading a, a columnist who uh, wrote a column in 1973 that... He had just watched um, It's a Wonderful Life, and it was on the Late Late Show, and he kind of complained or griped that it should have been earlier where more people could have seen it. Then 1974 comes, and it wasn't like the floodgates came pouring out and suddenly It's a Wonderful Life was on all the time. But in 1974, it started. I think a couple of TV stations, they realize, hey, it's in the public domain. We can run this. And then other TV stations, you know, the executives talk or they watch what other stations are doing, their competitors, and they're realizing, oh, wow, we could do this too. I was um, young enough that, you know, I don't um, remember the, 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 the inflection point, the moment of change. This is Laura Robinson one of three daughters born to Philip Van Doren Stern's only daughter. You'll meet the other two in future episodes. Philip wrote the original short story from which Wonderful Life was adapted. My grandfather was interested in important ideas, the multiverse, the butterfly effect, you know, whatever it is. But I think the man that I remember was a student of the human condition. The desire to love and be loved to be an integral part of community, to contribute to our community. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? That little idea that came to Philip Van Doren Stern in 1938 in a mysterious dream, each person's impact on all others, proves captivating to Americans a full 30 years later and thereafter. It became ubiquitous. Will you welcome, please, the uh, incredible Steven Spielberg. It's 1981. Steven Spielberg, the movie director, has just released something called Indiana Jones, and he's working on his latest called E.T. He's talking to Dick Cavett, the talk show host. I, I have three or four films that I'll always watch if they're on the late show or at a festival nearby. Do you have a little handful of ones a, like that? I have, I have, a, I have an apple barrel full of them. Oh, you do? Yeah, but, but I mean, among my favorite films, I'll, I'll watch any time the Searchers. The Searchers? Yes, and I'll watch any time. So, and it's a wonderful life. Anytime it's on Christmas, summer, yeah. whatever it's on, I'll watch that. It shows that every human being on the planet Earth matters. Every single human being on the face of the planet makes a difference. What calling Orson. Come in, Orson. Two years earlier, 1979. Another television studio audience, this one inside stage 27 of the Paramount Pictures lot in Los Angeles, California, witnesses the filming of a sitcom, Mork and Mindy. And unbeknownst to them, an odd little footnote of history. The first instance of the 1970s in which TV series storytellers seek to use Wonderful Life's core concept for their purposes. The first, as you know, of what will become so many. This is Robin Williams, the comedian. Seems that no matter how hard I try, I keep lousing up the lives of the people I care for. 
I've got to come home, sir. I'm, I'm pig slop. Well, perhaps. But let's make sure. A newly developed process which will enable you to see what paths your friends would have taken the past year had you not come into their life. I guess we're flattered that we were the first ones to use that premise to take off on it. But it, it seems natural. You're hearing Ed Sharlak, the television writer, and Tom Tenowich, his frequent writing partner. They drafted the Mork and Mindy television episode, It's a Wonderful Mork. Uh, this is Tom. It's such a universal feeling, you know. On the surface, we all try to put on a good face, but there are those private moments that we often don't admit to anyone, but you're face to face with it yourself. By showing how somebody, what, what the world would be like without somebody, you really get to know the value of somebody. Oh, calling us. Come in, your fat too. Down, baby, get down. Ha, don't. <laughs> Sir, you never guess what I learned. I learned that I'm okay. I'm not as bad as I thought I was. That's a lesson one can only learn from the school of oneself. Five, six, seven, eight, Schlemiel, Schlemizel, Heisenberg Incorporated. Saturday Night Movie, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart. Story of a man who wishes he was never born. Huh. It's the story of my life right now. Certainly wish I was never born. Look at this case as an excursion into the real Americana, eh? Like being part of a, a Frank Capra movie. Hmm? Who? Frank Capra, the director. You know, it's a wonderful life. Mr. D's Ghost Town. Jimmy Stewart, Donna Reed, Gary Cooper. Main Street, America. The town square with a bandstand smack in the middle. G.I. Joe! G.I. Joe is there. What, what is it you want, Mary? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. John Wayne? Jimmy Stewart in It's a Wonderful Life. What was it inside this movie from the 1940s that so resonated when received by Americans of the 1980s? What makes this question so relevant is that the time period corresponds with a marked rise in cynicism and hopelessness. More on that in a bit. I mean, it's just unbelievable how uh, it's everywhere. Philip Van Dorenstern's granddaughter Laura again. Honestly, I, I probably couldn't come up with a single long-running sitcom that hasn't done a, you know... It's a wonderful life again. How many times a day are they going to show this golden moldy? Six. From now until New Year's on Channel 13, it's a wonderful month. Oh, oh, here comes the gushiest part. Oh, have they no shame? Oh, yuck, 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 yuck. You're going to miss It's a Wonderful Life. Well, it's on again at 9 and 9.30 and 11. <laughs> and at midnight in Spanish. Una vida wonderful mente. And uh, to the point where, you know, I'll, I'll be watching a, a show and then I'll see that they're headed down their direct line. Oh, it's their turn now, you know. Watch the ending. I was too depressed. It just kept getting worse and worse. It should have been called It's a Sucky Life. And just when you think it can't suck anymore, it does. Everybody does it. Everybody does it because it's such a universal, you know, it's such a universal story. Jesus. Merry Christmas! 
enough already. And the corollary to a world without you proves just as powerful. Uh, some call it uh, sliding doors, or roads diverged, or simply different choices. Hi, I'm Ray, and I live here in Long Island with my wife, Deborah. Where'd you sleep with her? You don't exist? It's like it's a wonderful life. There's no Deborah. Well, then it's not a wonderful life, oh. is it? <laughs> And now a movie named Mr. Destiny uses the formula again with Michael Caine playing a supernatural being who steps in when James Belushi grows discontented with his life. Instead of missing the baseball, however, you hit it. Then you became a hero, married the prom queen, and so on and so forth. Americans seem to become obsessed by the fork in the road, whether the path chosen was the right one. Why? The breaking news just into CNN is that actor Robin Williams is dead at the age of 63 from an apparent suicide. Anything that can uh, help people that are going in that direction is, is really very, very important and wonderful. And I'm glad that there are organizations and professions that, that are there. That was his decision to, to leave the, the planet, so to speak. But, uh, you know, he, he had a great gift that was making other people happy and, and, and uh, giving uh, pleasure to people's lives. And to see that go away is, is uh, sad. We lost something very special. And uh, I hope he's at peace now and uh, making Clarence from, from the movie uh, happy. <laughs> well, sir, I don't know how much value I have in this universe. But I do know that I made a few people happier than they would have been without me. And as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever need to be. A mere 20 years after Robin Williams first recorded his take on a still mostly unknown old movie, by the late 1990s and early 2000s, the American Film Institute conducts a series of polls of filmmakers, journalists, historians, and well-known Americans looking at 40,000 American films. Wonderful Life is voted the 11th greatest movie ever, 8th greatest love story, 3rd greatest fantasy movie, and the most inspiring of all time. George Bailey is ninth greatest hero in all American movies, and Mr. Potter, 6th greatest villain. Many comment that their vote is driven by its central theme, the impact of every individual, whether considered big or small, on everyone else on Earth. But how exactly had this incredible comeback story happened, beginning in the 1970s, resulting in wonderful life suddenly everywhere in your pop culture, now widely considered among the greatest? I'm taking you closer to that story now. One year, we just said to ourselves, let's have a party. Yeah. And it's a wonderful life. And the party was born. Uh, David White again, uh, from the very beginning of this episode. December after December, over the 1970s, Christopher Little and he hosted a group of friends and like-minded associates to watch Wonderful Life. The party often took place in Christopher's Manhattan loft in the Flatiron District where he also kept his photography studio, a good screening room. Just out of college students, and we used to go to Astor Place Liquor Store in Manhattan and buy the cheapest uh, bourbon and scotch. We had to scour um, a TV guide trying to find out. This is pre-Betamax, pre-VCR, um, and we weren't rich enough to uh, rent a projector and rent, rent the film. And then we would just have the party whenever it was on. The really impressive thing that, that struck me was that the party was an instant hit. Everybody just loved the movie, and it, it took off instantly and became an instant tradition that first night that we got together. And the same people came next year, and we had some more people. So it finally became, I don't know, a crowd of about 70 people. Yeah. 60 to 70 people. There were rules. <laughs> uh, there were rules. You definitely weren't allowed to uh, 
um, watch it at any other time than at the party. And secondly, um, if you um, missed a year, you were pretty, you were in pretty bad trouble. Um, <laughs> took, took took a couple of years to get back on the list. You'd have to beg and scrabble to get back on our list. We had to uh, applaud when Zuzu's rose petals were found in George Bailey's pockets. Zuzu's petals! Zuzu! There they are! Bert! What do you know about that? Merry Christmas! I can tell you, the, when we get to our party, the room was full of weeping people of like mind who just uh, adored all the elements of that almost perfect movie. I guess you'd have to say, with all humility, it was a fairly, intellectual is not the right word, but it was a fairly bright crowd. We had a couple of architects who attended, um, two of my favorite people on earth. One was called Ralph Wolf, and um, the other one was a guy called Patrick Curley. And then I'm going to build things. I'm going to build airfields. I'm going to build skyscrapers a hundred stories high. I'm going to build bridges a mile long. Two marriages would result from the decade-long party. Here they come! Here they come! Ralph and Betty um, got married at my family's house on the shore in, on Long Island Sound, and Patrick and Jane, as a wedding present and a surprise, hired a uh, an airplane towing one of those long banners. And the banner read, Ralph and Betty, It's a Wonderful Life. More on the impact of their party in a bit. But first, something important to this story is happening elsewhere. I'm taking you across the country to America's other coast, to Marina del Rey, part of the metropolitan sprawl of Los Angeles. It's summer, 1974. We're outside a building that looks like a warehouse, uh, the new offices of National Telefilm Associates, uh, known as NTA. A convertible T-Bird pulls up out front, Hunter Green with a lion hood on him. The man getting out of this beautiful automobile is Bernie Tabakin, president of NTA. Uh, he doesn't know it yet, but he and his team are about to be part of the biggest hoops in American cinematic history. Bernie Tabakin is my uncle. I'm a filmmaker. I was there, you know, between between projects. I was editing various uh, projects for, for my uncle Bern. This is Jerry Sindel, then a young up-and-coming independent filmmaker working for his uncle while making cult film classic Teenager. When I moved to L.A., Bernie helped me get my first job in the film business. It's how, how come I ended up in the film. And I lived with him for the first months. I, first few months I came out to, to California. And NTA was probably the largest single owner of movies that ran on television stations around the country. So if you were anywhere in the U.S. watching movies after a certain hour, you know, after midnight, the movies that were running all came from NTA. There was a fairly large uh, legal team at NTA because they had thousands and thousands of copyrights to, to manage. Um, the the in-house counsel was a guy named Lipton. His daughter was Peggy Lipton, who was on the television show. If you're not of the age to be familiar with Peggy Lipton, the actress, and her hit show that had just wrapped up at the time, The Mod Squad, uh, then you're probably of the age to be familiar with Peggy's actress daughters with musician Quincy Jones, Kidada and Rashida Jones. Every time she laughs, an angel dies. This moment, they had just taken over a large warehouse near, uh, in Marina del Rey. The offices were in front. At some point, Bernie made a deal with Cary Grant. And uh, there was, a, I think Bernie must have handed him a, a check for a million dollars at some point. And a picture of that was on Bernie's wall. There was Lipton run, running legal. I was in the end of the front third of the building. Uh, it was my cutting room, which when I walked out of it, I walked into the warehouse. That was the two thirds that was occupied by racks of films. It was a bustling, busy place. So the one end, you know, was a, there was a toe in the water. Of, of glamorous Hollywood. 
and the back end was the real world of, you know, shipping and renting out movies in in, in bulk. <laughs> that was that was the the uh, the vibe. I was just there during a year, and I remember listening to the Watergate hearings during, at lunchtime. What did the president know? And when did he know it? Steve knew every important film that NPA had in the warehouse there. And I said, what should I see? So they said, oh, this is a film uh, that Frank Capra made called It's a Wonderful Life. And uh, we just struck a new print of it. She should run it. And I sat down in a screening room by myself, a 35 millimeter projector, and ran that film reel by reel by reel by reel. And it just was an overwhelming, unbelievable experience. And I was like, oh, my God, this is a masterpiece. And there I am sitting with this thing in a staggeringly gorgeous print. Uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience, one of the best experiences of my life, certainly as a filmmaker. And it was around this time that the future grandfather of Rashida Jones and his legal team somehow, some way, simply overlooked the renewal of one of their movies with the U.S. Copyright Office. Quietly, without much notice, wonderful life seemed to have slipped for the first time as if by magic out of the hands of ownership of any corporation and into the legal public domain. It was suddenly widely understood to be the property of you and all the people. Early that December, the programmer at an Allentown, Pennsylvania television station abruptly swaps it in to replace the scheduled airing of a Jimmy Cagney movie. Other stations around the country begin to follow suit, and Bernie Tabakin, who is Jewish but loves Christmas and goes caroling each year with Bob Hope, never mentions a word about what happened with Wonderful Life. Uh, this is his son, John. My father put it close to the vest. Never mentioned a word about it. Because I had to say my father was sort of tight-lipped about personal stuff. It may have been Lipton's responsibility, because that was his department managing copyrights. I do not know why in the world did they strike this gorgeous new print at the same time they were losing the copyright. It doesn't make sense. There is something going on with that. As far as what became of Bernie... Well, I think he wanted to make a good movie and never quite realized that dream. But I think he was proud of what he did at NTA. It was sort of pioneering work. But he didn't, ultimately, he didn't like being in the distribution business. He wanted to be in production. But I think in film business, you have to risk it all to be successful. You can't dab your toe in the water. But Frank Capra did risk it all when he went all in on Wonderful Life to start his company, Liberty Films. It failed, and his dream of independence died with it. Uh, I will take you much closer to that in a future episode. But thanks in part to Bernie Tabakin and uh, Rashida Jones' grandfather, his film would get a second chance. So I want to speak to you first tonight about a subject even more serious than energy or inflation. I want to talk to you right now about a fundamental threat to American democracy. Now it's five years after the events with NTA. We're back in the year 1979 again, around the time of the taping of the Mork and Mindy episode. From the White House, you're hearing Jimmy Carter, the president. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. We can see this crisis in the growing doubt about the meaning of our own lives and in the loss of a unity of purpose for our nation. The erosion of our confidence in the future is threatening to destroy the social and the political fabric of America. We've always believed in something called progress. We've always had a faith that the days of our children 
would be better than our own. Our people are losing that faith, not only in government itself, but in the ability as citizens to serve as the ultimate rulers and shapers of our democracy. Around the same time that a national malaise comes to concern Jimmy, an article in the New Yorker will raise the profile of the now apparently public domain wonderful life, and the butterfly effect of it becomes impactful in your universe. The publication of that piece not only put us on the map, but it had a, a huge role in putting It's a Wonderful Life back on the map. This is Christopher again. Uh, the Wonderful Life Party Thrower. One of the um, sort of mid, mid-period mid invitees was a guy called Mark Singer, who, who, with whom I went to college and became great friends with. And Mark was at that time a, um, a writer at the New... Actually, he still is a writer at the New Yorker. And after a couple of times of coming, he said to us... Um, would you, mind, you guys mind if I um, wrote a talk piece, talk of the town piece about this? And <laughs> we said, of course not. The New Yorker, January 15th, 1979. Talk of the town. Wonderful. For reasons of their own, Christopher Little and David White firmly believe that this life, damn it, is a wonderful life. Annually, they throw a small party to celebrate that shared perception of reality. What they do at the party is this. They have a few drinks and eat a few ham sandwiches, and then they watch an old movie on television. Specifically, they watch It's a Wonderful Life. I uh, was in bed asleep in my minuscule apartment on West 21st Street, um, which cost $239 a month. And um, the phone rang, waking me up. And I answered, and the person on the other end of the phone said, Mr. Little. And I said, yes. Nobody ever called me Mr. Little, still don't. And he said, and these are his very words, My name is Frank Capra, and you have given me the best Christmas present of my entire life. And I want to thank you guys. And if you ever think of me, I would love to come to your party. So please, bear me in mind. And if you'd like to send me an invitation, I would be thrilled. So Christopher and I put our heads together, and we composed a letter, and I sent it off to Hollywood. And Chapman wrote back saying, I will be there. And that Christmas, Frank Capra and his son Pound Capra walked into Christopher's law, and... <laughs> Everybody let down their hair. There was no formality. He brought with him a um, a print, um, four reels, which he told us he'd been showing to his family um, ever since 1946. And one of the amazing treats was, you might call it the director's cut, because there were scenes we'd never seen. What a lovely guy. We had a memorial chair. And we would always invite somebody who, without letting them know, that we thought was particularly despairing that year. And so we would always have a special guest, and she or he never knew that they were, in fact, the special guest. I want to live again. I want to live again. I want to live again. Please, God, let me live again. I have one I have one notion about this movie, which I think should should be up high. And that is, it, it has a direct relevance to today because it centers around a suicide attempt. It's a Christmas movie, but it also centers around a suicide attempt. And we have a suicide epidemic in this country. And Clarence, an angel, is sent down from heaven to uh, talk George out of jumping off the bridge. And he does it by a wonderful method, which is not therapy or counseling, he shows George what his life would have been like if he had never lived in Vietnam, jumped off the bridge. And it's wonderful. It's like having suicide discussed by Mark Twain or Winslow Homer or Sinclair Lewis or Nolan Rockwell. And I, I think it's, it's a real, 
issue that needs to be addressed today. And uh, this movie addresses it with the softest, warmest glow that you can imagine. We had a question and answer session. Yeah. And uh, Christopher uh, stood up and said, Frank is saying he'd be happy to take any questions that anyone in the audience might have. And there were a lot of questions and answers. At one point, um, when things were kind of winding down, um, um, Frank Capra said, Oh, I just remembered a story about Lionel Barrymore. Would you like to hear it? Do I have any time left? And I said, you've got all night, my friend. You have all night. <laughs> Christopher felt he saw clearly Frank's own recognition that the widespread belief that his movie was now public domain, combined with the new cool factor coming from the party written about in The New Yorker, was finally turning Wonderful Life into something it had never been before, a hit. Capra was so vocal about how important he felt this was to him, his life changed. Um, I really believe that. And I think he felt, I think he knew that that was happening and that, and that would be happening. It's the damnedest thing I've ever seen. The film has a life of its own now, and I can only look at it as if I had nothing to do with it. I'm like a parent whose kid grows up to be president. My fellow Americans, this is the 34th time I'll speak to you from the Oval Office and the last. We've been together eight years now, and soon it'll be time for me to go. It's 1989 now. In just ten years, pop culture takes on Wonderful Life have become so plentiful as to now be seen as cliché. And something seems to take a turn around this time. How can you hate It's a Wonderful Life? This stinks, it bites, it blows. <laughs> It's worth considering why the value of every individual was considered in such short supply that its currency went up so drastically over the 1980s. If at the start of the decade, Americans seemed to be responding to something inside this movie almost desperately, as if it were an antidote, by the end of the Reagan years, hope seems lost. And it's right at this time that media inspired by the movie reaches a crescendo. And there's never been more than in this period. But suddenly, they all seem to embrace a certain cynicism. Well, I'll show you what I mean. I'm a guardian angel. <laughs> in fact, I'm, uh, I'm looking for uh, an Al Bundy. Do you know an Al Bundy? I'm Al Bundy. No! <laughs> American storytellers are looking for ways to reflect the realities they see around them. And strangely, despite being from 40 years in the past, Clarence and George and Potter seem to offer much in that regard. I love you. 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 Now that's the straw that broke the camel's back. I'm sorry, Bundy, I failed you. Rupert Murdoch, one of the richest and some say meanest men in the world, has just launched his new television network, Fox. And the makers of its very first primetime series, Married with Children, decide to again show someone what the world would be like without them, but with a new twist. I was supposed to show you why you should live, but I can't think of one darn reason. Wait a second. I want to be back with my family. Why? Look at them. They're happy. Not a care in the world. You think I'm going to let that happen after all the grief they put me through? <laughs> I want to live! I know it's funny, uh, but if you think about it, uh, this is a little dark, isn't it? A father discovering his entire family is better off if he'd never been born. It's perhaps telling that at this moment others seem to be considering the inverse of George Bailey's lesson, that if each person's life touches so many others, some bad actors may be responsible for an outsized negative impact on everyone. So think about Christmas. It's the one I'd want to talk about. 
It's the one from the previous generation. It's a wonderful life. You're hearing John McTiernan, the movie director. Specifically, the Potterville sequence, which is what happens when the evil banker gets to do what he wants in the community without Jimmy Stewart getting in a way to stop it. And it's the clearest criticism of runaway unregulated cowboy capitalism has ever done in an American movie. And I wondered, how did that wind up in a Christmas movie? And the answer came back like a scream. Because it was in a Christmas movie, you fool. So I went to Joel. You know my name, but who are you? Just another American who saw too many movies as a child. Another orphan of a bankrupt culture who thinks he's John Wayne, Rambo, Marshall Dillon. I was always kind of partial to Roy Rogers, actually. And that is how Die Hard became it. We hadn't intended it to be a Christmas movie, but the joy that came from it is what turned it into a Christmas movie. Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Absolutely not. This is George Clooney, wow. the actor. Talking to Stephen Colbert, the comedian. You realize this is a controversial answer. I will tell you, it is not a Christmas movie. And I'll tell you why. Christmas movies are for the family to gather around and celebrate being together and celebrate uh, life and, you know, and love. And Die Hard is a spectacular film, as I've just picked it as my action film. But It's a Wonderful Life is your Christmas movie. Are you saying wonder- you don't want to sit around with the whole family, with the kids and grandma, and watch Hans Gruber fall off of Nakatomi Plaza? Well, I'll tell you why. And, and this is actually a very important thing. Grandma's dead. And that would be really you know hard what? to sit around. That would be difficult. Prior to this point in time, somewhere in the past, the timeline skewed into this tangent, creating an alternate 1985 in which Biff is corrupt and powerful and married to your mother, Marion Rich. This has happened to me. Many fans of this 1989 sequel to Back to the Future notice a heavy dose of Pottersville inspiration in the dark alternate 1980s, in which a school bully type, Biff Tannen, manages to achieve wealth and power, even becoming a casino owner. Can you imagine if something like that ever happened in real life? (laughs) To writers Bob Gale and Bob Zemeckis, the idea was then the stuff of nightmares. His high-risk gambling and good fortune turned him into one of America's greatest living heroes. His charm attracted the world's most sought-after beauties. His power and influence made him the model of world leaders and heads of state. Inside, you will learn how Biff Tannen became one of the richest and most powerful men in America. I just want to say one thing. God bless America. No! When a producer from my team messaged Bob Gale, inviting him to be part of this podcast, his agent responded with a statement. Bob doesn't give comments out regarding Biff and Trump. Hmm. Out of respect for him, then, I won't bring you inside any of his private conversations on the matter. But uh, Americans on Twitter have certainly felt they noticed a connection. At J underscore Ha 3, September 2015. Does anyone else make the connect between Biff Tannen and Mr. Potter running their cities and Donald Trump running for prez? Hashtag, it didn't end well. At Jeff O'Seal, December 24th, 2017. I just watched It's a Wonderful Life for the first time. Two thoughts. One, it's surprisingly very anti-capitalist. And uh, Back to the Future Part 2 totally ripped off that movie. Also, Potter equals Biff equals Trump. At Dave J2, January 2018. Cross Biff Tannen and Mr. Potter and their surrealistic icky towns, and you get Donald Trump with everything on a large scale, because he is bigly. At David S. Buchanan 1, May 2020, in this version of populism, Mr. Potter would be the hero. 
great connection. Trump is some weird combination of Biff and Potter. Well, you get the idea. Uh, there are hundreds more I could read. I wonder what my life would have been like if I'd never seen that movie. Mm -hmm. Attention all personnel, please keep working during the following announcement. And now, our boss and friend, Mr. Burns. Also on Murdoch's channel in 1989, The Simpsons begins its long television run with a Christmas episode. As some suspect that uh, Mr. Burns is meant to be a Mr. Potter for what's become of the American workplace. Hello. I'm proud to announce that we've been able to increase safety here at the plant without increasing the cost to the consumer or affecting management pay raises. However, for you semi-skilled workers, there will be no Christmas bonuses. Oh, oh and one more thing. <laughs> Merry Christmas! Mr. Shirley, Merry Christmas. Who's that? It's, uh, it's me, Clark Griswold. What do you want? My wife and I came up with a little something special. It's, it's a gift. Put it over there with the others, Griswold. John Hughes bringing in to a little bit of that Capricorn of, shall we say, into Christmas vacation, which uh, he did manage to bring in some Capricorn. Frank Capra III is Frank's grandson, who became a successful Hollywood producer in his own right. Back in 1989, he is brought on by the team of writer and producer John Hughes to assist and direct another movie destined to become a Christmas classic. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. It's another one of these movies. It's going to be around a long time. We all know about It's a Wonderful Life. That's not going away any, anywhere, <laughs> anytime soon. I was very close to my grandfather. Probably uh, there's 10 grandchildren, three kids. I was the closest uh, to him out of all of them. I've asked Frank Capra the first, uh, who will neither confirm nor deny this assertion. So for me, it was... I was still very young, you know, that was the mid eighties for me. So I was still an upcoming second assistant director, working my way up to being a first AD producer. And it's funny because there's one scene in the kitchen where Jeremiah said to me, Hey, Frankie, um, can we put a, a, a clip of it's a wonderful life on the TV in the kitchen with Chevy? I was like, why wouldn't you? It's a public domain. We'll clear it, no problem. Look, Daddy, teacher says every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings. Folks, folks, Merry Christmas. Frank believes that any portrait at the end of the 1980s of a working American and his family during the holidays had to find a way to balance hope and despair. And John Hughes surely looked to wonderful life for inspiration. So in doing that whole final scene, in, you know, in that living room and Chevy pouring his frustration and his love and heart for his family out was actually pretty, pretty cool to do. It's for my company. Your bonus. My bonus. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's a one-year membership in the Jelly of the Month Club. Oh, God. Clark, that's the gift that keeps on giving the whole year. That's the whole thing about it. Christmas vacation. In a strange way, he kept a little of the dark undertones that were Grandpa had instated in It's a Wonderful Life. Not, I think, on purpose so much, but a driving home the, the theme of the movie? I lost my temper when I got my bonus, and I, I guess I said a few things I shouldn't have. Bonus? How did you get a bonus? 
I cut out bonuses this year. The, the corporate hotshot world. And, you know, this poor guy trying to do everything for his family, the life of Christmas tree. And pardon my language, everything he touches, he fucks up. 17 years with the company. I've gotten a Christmas bonus every year but this one. You don't want to give bonuses, fine. But when people count on them as part of their salary, oh, what you did is just plain sucks. Thank you, Russ. For an unused portion. Well, what's a family for if it can't take care of its losers? The defining potter of 1980s media is perhaps J.R. Ewing, win at all cost inheritor of Ewing Oil Company. I'm going to bring Bobby down. I'm going to cut him out if I have to destroy Ewing Oil to do it. And like many of the potters of that decade, he is more dangerous because he makes it seem fun. <laughs> and as they say, is sexy. Tell me, JR, which slut are you going to stay with tonight? What difference does it make? Whoever it is, it's got to be more interesting than the slut I'm looking at right now. Two years after Married with Children explored whether the world might not be better off without certain people, the storytellers behind Dallas are trying to find the perfect way to end their hit show and JR's popular story when they decide to take this thought even darker. That you're some sort of a Fredo's angel and I'm your good deed, huh? <laughs> hmm. You got it upside down and backwards, but in essence, that's about it. When J.R. becomes suicidal, a fantastical being arrives to show him another universe where he was never born. Some things are better, some are worse. Ultimately, the message to J.R. seems to be that this one man's existence has made no real difference at all, good or bad. But is what he's shown real or a mean-spirited trick? At the end, a revelation. Then why don't you go ahead and kill yourself? <laughs> and send you back to heaven a failure? <laughs> You'll never become an angel. <laughs> <laughs> What makes you think I'm from heaven? <laughs> Earlier, I told you that you know George as a character in a movie. It's a wonderful life. Have you figured out what that means yet? Like when we took George to Pottersville, you too live in one of the universes where George Bailey was never born. This is why I'm coming to you. Over the next nine episodes of this podcast, we're going to look at how the Potters have gained the upper hand in nearly every aspect of life in your universe. We are going to meet some of the people trying to fill the void for George Bailey and his partner Mary, who might be more important than you thought. And, like George, you're wrestling not only with external enemies, but internal ones. So keep listening. For now, let's conclude with this. Only four months after that Dallas TV episode upside downed Philip Van Doren Stern's beautiful message that every person makes a deep impact to push J.R. Ewing to commit suicide, Frank Capra, a man who made a positive impact on your universe, joins us up here. I'm taking you to one of his last public appearances in Los Angeles. Wonderful life has just risen again like a phoenix. Most of the movie industry and Frank's spouse, children and grandchildren look on as he's awarded for his life's work. Everybody should watch that AFI tribute speech he gave for 12 minutes at the AFI award, because that basically sums it all up what Capra was. Tonight, I'm going to tell you the real secret of the whole thing. It's the love of people. And add two simple ideals to this love of people. The freedom of each individual and the equal importance of each individual. And you have the principle upon which I've based all my films. And may I say a word? to this new generation. Don't follow trends. Dark trends. 
Don't compromise. Believe in yourself. Because only the valiant can create. Only the daring should make films. And only the morally courageous are worthy of speaking to their fellow man for two hours and in the dark. George Bailey was never born. Visit SaveGeorgeBailey.com to join the mission. There you'll find links to works by this episode's participants. Learn more about how to celebrate George Bailey Day on Saturday, December 9th, and annually the second Saturday of December hereafter, by hosting your own Wonderful Life viewing party. Tell your friends to listen to this show, subscribe, like, comment, and post about it on social media. Hashtag SaveGeorgeBailey. Subscribe to our Patreon to hear uncut interviews and bonus content. The podcast also available on YouTube. iHeartMedia presents a double asterisk iHeartMedia co-production in association with True Stories. Created, written, and directed by Joseph, Kurt Angfer, and Rayna Vyshelsky. Kurt Angfer, producer and supervising editor. Rayna Vyshelsky, producer and journalist. Elizabeth Marcus, editor. Roy Sillings, narrator. George Bailey theme song by Carolyn Sills. By her albums. Soundtrack composed by Zachary Walter. By his albums and the original soundtrack to this podcast available wherever you get your music. Mallory Kinoy, co-producer, writer's assistant, archival producer, and fact checker. John Autry, sound engineer, additional editing, sound design, and mix. Executive producers, Dave Cassidy, Kurt Angfer, Lindsay Hoffman and Beth Ann Macaluso for iHeartMedia, John Duffy for Double Asterisk, Ruth Vaca for True Stories, Reyna Vyshelsky for Double Asterisk and True Stories, Elizabeth Honkuch, Associate Producer, Brandon Lavoie and Ryan Pennington, Consulting Producers, Keith Sklar, Contract Legal, Peter Yazzie, Copyright and Fair Use Legal, Maddie Akers, Archival Specialist, Ron Kadish and Benji Michaels, Publicists, Kavya Santhanam and Marley Weaver, Marketing and Promotions, Art and Web Design by Aaron Kim. Interns were Kyra Gray, Emma Ramirez, Eva Stewart, and Taya Wilson. Podcast license for Philip Van Doren Stern's The Greatest Gift provided by The Greatest Gift Corporation. Their attorney is Kevin Koloff. Recorded at David Weber's Airtime Studios in Bloomington, Indiana. This episode featured, in chronological order, David White, Christopher Little, Jeff Williams, Laura Robinson, Jerry Sindel, John Tabakin, Ed Sharlak, Tom Tenowich, and Frank Capra III, with appearances by Neil Howe, Paul Zimmy Finn, Jennifer O'Neill, Jefferson Cowie, Sharon Fogarty, Monica Hess, Emily St. James, Lori Lindine, and the cast of Wonderful Life and the brief voices, music, and artistry of a who's who of Hollywood via clips used under the still-existing legal doctrine of of fair use. The Potters are working on that one, though. The voice of Mark Singer was played by his son, Paul Mailho Singer, reading the words written by Mark Singer for The New Yorker. The voice of Frank Capra was played by Mark Granby, grandnephew of Joseph Granby, the man who narrated Wonderful Life, based in parts on accounts by Little White and Singer, and in one part by Frank's words spoken to the Wall Street Journal in 1984. Frank's AFI speech is spoken by Frank himself. Some original research by Jeff Williams for this episode. Go to doubleasteriskmedia.com to hear our other limited-run podcasts, Who is Rich Blee? After the Uprising, with a bold new season in St. Louis coming summer 2024, and Origins, Birth of a Pandemic. And subscribe to True Stories New Weekly, Everybody Has a Podcast, with Ruth and Ray. If you are feeling like you're on the bridge, please call the AFSP's Suicide and Crisis Lifeline by dialing 988 into your phone or contact the Crisis Text Line by texting 741-741. Consider donating to or volunteering with AFSP or your local Habitat for Humanity and make George Bailey proud. We're not affiliated with them, though. Copyright 2023, Double Asterisk, Inc.